Last time, we took a look at the birth of the F-14 Tomcat and the vice grip it had on the media of its day. Of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. The evolution of the aircraft is just as, if not more interesting than the circumstances surrounding its birth. From the addition of a long-range television camera to the installation of improved engines, we're taking a peek at the evolution of the F-14. The initial variant of the F-14, the A model, was a hell of a supercomputer compared to its predecessors. However, even in the beginning, Grumman had big plans for the fledgling turkey. An important addition came from when the Navy was still requiring visual identification of enemy aircraft for a missile shot. During the Vietnam War, identification friend or foe was a new tool used by American aircraft, which would allow the crew of, say, an F-4 to determine if the aircraft they were tracking on radar was friendly or a bandit. As I discussed in my F-4 video, this is still pretty early on for the technology, and to prevent friendly fire, Phantom crews had to get up close to ID a target visually before pulling the trigger. The initial solution to the problem came from early F-15 crews in the late 1970s, who began bringing privately purchased rifle scopes on flights to extend their visual range from 3 to 6 miles. During the 1979 USS America cruise, F-14 Tomcat pilots who caught wind of the trick asked the Navy to supply VF-213 Black Lions with a batch of scopes. The Navy supply system, misunderstanding the request, instead sent the Black Lions a scope, or 144 pairs, of reading glasses. That's when John Hawk Smith of the squadron had his father send him over a 3x9 Weaver scope from home. The 3x9 scope allowed Hawk to identify a MiG-sized aircraft at about 7 miles, greatly improving the identification range. Testing with a scope proved so successful that all fighter squadrons based in Miramar, California were authorized to purchase rifle scopes for their crews. Grumman soon came up with a more permanent solution. Working with Northrop, who developed the Tizio system for the Air Force F-4s, a new chin pod was developed for the Tomcat. Slung beneath the AUG-9 radar antenna, the new camera, dubbed AXX-1 Television Camera System, could reliably identify aircraft at 10 miles. The closed-circuit television would display the camera's feed on the pilot's upper screen, known as the VDI. Not only could the camera see straight ahead, it could slew about per the Rio control inputs, and it could also be slaved to the AUG-9 radar. Instead of locking a target at long range and IDing up close with the aforementioned scope, the TCS could instantly snap to the radar contact. TCS footage could even be recorded onto a tape in the F-14 for later viewing. This was useful for rudimentary reconnaissance, uh, getting a close-up look at the best bear bomber, or even capture lessons from mock dogfights. TCSs were retrofitted to the F-14A, and later came standard on the F-14B and the F-14D Super Tomcat. Speaking of reconnaissance, another tool that came to the F-14 was the TARPS or the Tactical Airborne Reconnaissance Pod System. Before the TARPS pod, the US Navy maintained a fleet of dedicated recon aircraft like the RFA Crusader and the RA-5 Vigilante, both of which served alongside the new CAD on the carrier deck. By the mid-1980s, however, the aging recon birds were being phased out in favor of the new TARPS pod. Now, just because it wasn't a dedicated recon bird didn't mean the F-14 wasn't a good set of eyes for the fleet. The 1,850-pound TARPS pod was fitted to the rear Phoenix space in the Tomcat's gutter and required a bit of modification to work. The TARPS pod was fitted with a multitude of cameras. The forward bay had a 150mm serial frame camera on a rotating mount that could point straight down or up at 45 degrees forward. The middle section housed the KA-99 panoramic camera that swiveled to the port and starboard positions of the F-14 for side photos. Finally, the rear section of the pod carried an infrared line scanner camera for nighttime photography. The TARPS pod was extremely successful, allowing battle damage assessments and threat analyses for future missions. A notable early use of the TARPS pod was to survey air defenses in the Bekaa Valley during the 1983 Lebanon strikes. Limitations in the KA-99 required the Tomcats to fly as low as 10,000 feet above the Sam Redden Valley, prompting a program to upgrade the pod's capabilities. In 1984, the Navy upgraded the TARPS with a KA-93 910mm long-range optic, which allowed future TARPS missions to be flown at safer altitudes. Wouldn't you know, the TARPS even helped people back in the States. In the 1993 Mississippi River flood, FEMA put in a request for the Navy to fly TARPS missions over the affected areas to determine the amount of damage caused. Hell, a friggin' TARPS mission was flown during the Waco siege, which... Well, okay, I'm not gonna really get into that today.
Even in the 1970s, the US Navy sought to replace the TF-30 engine that I talked about last episode. If you haven't seen it, check it out here. The short and skinny of it is that it was a turbofan intended for the F-111B, which had issues at high angles of attack and resulted in quite a few Tomcat losses. John Lehman, Secretary of the Navy, was quoted as saying this of the TF-30 and Tomcat combination. Probably the worst engine airframe mismatch we've had in years. So yeah, they needed an upgrade. Early tests with the Pratt & Whitney F-401 engines were promising, but the engine never saw widespread adoption by the Navy due to budgetary issues. In 1986, however, the F-14A+, later dubbed F-14B, came online, having been equipped with the GE F-110 turbofan. The F-110 was originally designed for use in the Air Force's F-15 and F-16 fleet to create an improved and more universal engine for the branch. The Navy's version, the F-110 GE-400, offered better reliability and performance, but it too had some teething issues to overcome. Early F-14Bs were reported to disintegrate or just flat out explode suddenly during high-speed flights. The new engines were found to be literally burning through their liners and into the airframe, resulting in total destruction of the aircraft. Once the problem was isolated, however, it was a pretty simple move to improve the engine liners and, a mere six months after a 1993 VF-124 Tomcat breakup, all F-14s were renovated and the problem ceased. The F-110 proved to be and still is an extremely reliable engine, and was the backbone of the latter half of the Tomcat's career. Still, the Tomcat was to get even better. The addition of the TCS and F-110 along with a new digital flight control system and improved avionics culminated in the F-14D Super Tomcat. The Super Tomcat was a whole new bird, fitted with modern multifunction displays, a new heads-up display, and even an integrated infrared search and track pod. The IRST fitted alongside the TCS pod offered greater situational awareness for the crew and could track targets at long range without the need to blast radar waves out the nose which would, in turn, highlight the Tomcat. I'll be honest, a lot of the IRST's capabilities and functionality are still classified, and it was a one-of-a-kind capability for Western aircraft. On that note, F-22s are slated to receive IRST pods only now, almost 20 years after the last F-14D took to the air. The Super Tomcat also received a digital flight control system, which helped the pilot fly in conditions that would otherwise leave the F-14 in a spin or worse. Think of it as a limiter. Whereas earlier F-14s allowed the pilot to input commands that would throw the plane into a departure or put increased strain on the airframe during high-G maneuvers, the DFCS would take said inputs and only allow safe operation through the flight surfaces. The old 1960s era heads-up display was also quite antiquated by the 1990s. In short, you got a few numbers, some lines, and a dot. F*** you. The Navy replaced it with a similar HUD to that in the F-18. Important indications like speed, altitude, etc., previously relegated to steam gauges were right up in the pilot's face. The Rio pit was overhauled as well. Modern multifunction displays and digital screens replaced the old fishbowl that once displayed radar and other important data. The post-Cold War Tomcat squadrons also received the ability to carry the Lantern Designator pod that allowed them to drop laser-guided bombs. By the end of its career, the Tomcat was a true multi-role platform, able to do everything from reconnaissance, air-to-air -air intercepts, and could put a paved guided bomb through a window from 20,000 feet. Hell, even anti-radiation and anti-ship missiles were tested on the Tomcat, but they never made it to the fleet. What came with the end of the Cold War was a lesser need for a Cold War fleet defense fighter, however, and only 55 Super Tomcats were built or converted from old A stocks. So what about the rest of the 500 or so F-14s? Even F-14As and Bs of the fleet received numerous upgrades. The DFCS, Rio p set, and Lantern capabilities were applied to much of the fleet. An off-the-shelf HUD improvement came for legacy Tomcats in the form of the Sparrowhawk, based directly on the HUD in the F-18. Tomcats across the fleet also received the ALR-67 radar warning receiver in the 1990s. The 67 was a huge step up from the Vietnam-era ALR-45. The old 45 set was tuned to very specific Soviet surface-to-air missiles, and often resulted in air crews purchasing off-the-shelf radar scanners to help with identifying other kinds of threats. All this aside, due to budget cuts, there were still some old F-14As serving into the 2000s alongside their upgraded counterparts. Some airframes received certain upgrades and missed others. Oftentimes, there were no two Tomcats exactly alike in Navy squadrons. 
VF211 rocks some of the oldest Tomcats in the fleet, still with their TF30 engines until 2004 when they transitioned to Super Hornets. That leaves us with the end of the F-14's career. You're probably thinking, why? Why was the best fighter ever turned into scrap metal? I know, it's a hard thing to digest, but I have a short answer and a long answer for you. The short answer is Dick Cheney, but the long answer is a bit more nuanced. The military is always looking for cost-cutting measures. With the end of the Cold War and the risk of bombers hitting the fleet disappearing, the Navy didn't seem to need to maintain a fleet of heavy, expensive fighters. The F-18 Hornet family, with all its quirks aside, was a true multi-role package. It could dogfight, it could perform maritime strike, and it did it all for cheaper than the F-14. I'm not going into the exact hours or maintenance each plane needed or anything, but the newer F-18 was a hell of a lot easier to maintain than the old variable geometry platform. With the erasure of the long-range bomber threat and a lack of countries with fighters causing problems for us, it honestly made a bit of sense at the time to have this new multi-role platform and its upgraded Super Hornet evolution to take over the job of the F-14. For almost 30 years, we haven't had a near-peer threat that would warrant something doing the job of the Tomcat, and while hindsight is 2020, the Navy's decision to sunset the F-14 in 2006 didn't come out of nowhere. Granted, the F-14 was slated for further upgrades in the form of the Tomcat 21. This would have included integration of the AMRAAM missile series and further modernizations, but why would the Navy have wanted to go this route when the new Super Hornet already had AMRAAMs and Gucci tools like Link-16 and AESA radar? Not to mention, Vice President Dick Cheney had it out for Northrop Grumman, but that's a whole other bag of worms. It pains me to say this, it really does, but I understand why the F-14 was retired. Even if it stayed in service beyond 2006, there is no way in hell it would still be around. Supposed stealth upgrades that aviation enthusiasts like to lash onto were and still are a pipe dream. The Tomcat was finally put to bed on September 22nd, 2006. Of course, we weren't the only ones to have Tomcats. The Imperial Iranian Air Force purchased 79 F-14s from the US in the mid-1970s, only for them to fall into the hands of an American enemy when the Ayatollah came to town in 1979. While support for their F-14s was cut off after the revolution, the Iranian Air Force has done a surprisingly good job at maintaining their fleet and is the main reason most of the US Navy F-14s were scrapped in the 2000s, lest the Iranians get their hands on a flow of parts. Details on Iranian Tomcats aren't as clear-cut as their American brethren. They've been upgraded to carry the indigenous Fakor missile which was based on the Phoenix, and there are even photos of the old fighters packing Hawk serviced air missiles. Even so, the 50-year-old airframes are due to be replaced by Russian-built Su-35s in the coming years. It won't be long until the last F-14 in the world takes its last flight. The Tomcat has a hell of a history, and while it is a thing of the past, it still captivates those who look upon it. I love this plane. It was the naval fighter of the latter half of the 20th century, and laid the groundwork for the future of air warfare. As we find ourselves looking at the possibility of pure enemies threatening the carrier battle group, the job of the Tomcat is now relevant as it was in the Cold War. <laughs> The F-A-18 has been upgraded to carry the AIM-174B, a new beyond visual range missile that would have brought a tear to the Tomcat's eye. With a range of at least 130 miles, it has revived the capability once lost in the Tomcat's wake. The new FAXX program for the Navy is sure to invoke memories of the Tomcat's past, with a capability jump not seen since the Phantom drivers were able to transition to the F-14 in the 70s. Who knows? Maybe we'll see Grumman Cats return to the decks of aircraft carriers someday. Thanks for watching, and of course we have more Tomcat history coming up, so don't forget to subscribe and if you like the video, please leave me a like. It really does help me out. On that note, if you really want to help me out, consider joining my Patreon. It grants you special Discord access, the occasional art assets you see in these videos, and more. This wouldn't be a video of mine unless I mentioned my amazing patrons who keep the wheels turning around here. I couldn't do without you guys. Special thanks to my Ace of Aces tier, Captain Fantastic, Deuce, Ghoul, Iron, Jake Fuentes, Kodai, Pec Ops, Private Petey, Aspen, Tico, Weefy, Boats FG, Blake Storm Elite, and Pec Ops. You guys really are the GOAT. Is, is that is that you being used properly? Is that what you guys are saying now? Whatever. Keep that sun on your back now. Have a good one.
Tomcats across the fleet also received the ALR... ALR... 